If you're joining us online or you're watching at home, we're so glad that you're with us today. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. We started a series a long, 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 long time ago, all the way back in the month of August. Can you, re can you realize next week is already October? We could have a blizzard in two weeks. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? I know you thought it's supposed to bring us a good word, Pastor. We started this whole series a few weeks ago talking about the, the whole thing about believing for more. In fact, we started this whole series about believing for more all the way back in January. And I know that some of you, many of you are perhaps new since January. We talked about dreaming ahead for 2014, believing for more. And so we revisited the whole believing for more uh, campaign coming back in the last month of August. We started talking about faith, 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 this amazing thing, this amazing thing. Faith, sometimes we feel it. Sometimes Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we exercise it. Sometimes we, we don't know what we're supposed to do to exercise faith or to have faith. But faith is the belief that there is something that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. It can happen. It's already there. I haven't seen it. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. That's, that's what faith is. But then we also recognize that so, sometimes, 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 sometimes there's, there's barriers and obstacles to our faith. Sometimes there's the fear of the unknown and fear of the impossible and fear of disappointment and fear of sacrifice and all of those things can enter into our faith. And so we've kind of worked through this whole thing and this whole journey of faith. And we're going to finish this series today and start something brand new for you next week. But today, this is an important day for the life, for the life of Life Church. And I'm so glad that you're here today. This is a monumental day for us in Life Church. We're going to start a journey. We're going to begin an incredible journey as a church. And I want to share with you the heart of the pastor and the heart of Life Church and what we're doing in the months ahead. So let me just share with you a little bit of a story today. That a long, long time ago, in a land not so far away, God invented people. God invented people. Isn't that amazing? God invented people, and you know what? God cares about what God makes. We see this all the way back in the beginning of, of a book that we call the Bible. In, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, we see that God, God invented people, and he cared about people, but the incredible thing is that before he made people, he made provisions for their people. He made provisions by supplying all the things that people would need right here on this, this planet for us. And so into the midst of all that God had created, he put people, he invented people. And we read in the Bible that somewhere in the course of a day, God would come and visit what he had created. Adam and Eve are the first people that we read about. And in the cool of the day, God would come and walk with them in the garden. And I can imagine the conversations they would have. How exciting it would be to walk in the presence of your creator and your maker with nothing between Adam and Eve and their nakedness, feeling no shame, because it was absolute closeness, the most intimate intimacy that people could have with their God and their Father. In the cool of the day, they talked about life and all the problems and difficulties and struggles and trials and the fellowship and the, the great relationship they, they had. But then, as we know the story all too well, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve changed all that with one big decision. And sin entered into the world. And whenever there's sin, there's separation. Whenever we are steeped in sin, whenever we're steeped in selfishness, we're not thinking much about relationship with God. And so it was with Adam and Eve and with humanity ever since that there's this battle between us and God. And so uh, Adam and Eve kind of ruined it for themselves and for generations beyond that, that intimacy was gone. But nonetheless, even though Adam and Eve sinned and sin is in the midst of humanity, God still cares deeply about his creation and what he's made. That's been expressed all through the history of humanity, and we read about it in our Bible that eventually in the course of time, uh, there was a nation, nation, a nation called Israel. We still read about Israel. We see Israel in the news and in the media, but, but Israel had its beginnings all the way back in the, in the land of Egypt. And the Israelites are a nation that, that were birthed and grew up right under the nose of the most powerful nation of the world. And God had a plan for Israel and said, I want to express to the world through you who I am and the kind of relationship that people need to have with me. And so God said, I'm going to bust you out of here. 430 years of slavery the Israelites experienced in the land of Egypt. After 430 years, God says, let's get out of this place. I want you to come out into the wilderness. In fact, God told this guy named Moses who would lead his people, Moses, you go tell Pharaoh that I want my people to come out into the wilderness so that they can worship me. Because in worship, in worship, 
In worship, there's fellowship. In worship, there's intimacy. In worship, there's closeness. Well, uh, Moses leads more than a million people out of the land of Egypt. We don't know the exact number, but speculatively, it's uh, over a million people. It's quite a, quite a bunch of people. And uh, they get out into the wilderness. Now, I, 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 I've seen pictures of that wilderness area. You think if you moved here from places that have mountains and streams and trees, you think North Dakota is wilderness. Hallelujah, this is holy land here, I'm telling you. God does not vacation in North Dakota. He lives in North Dakota. There you go. All right. And this is wilderness. This is wilderness. And Moses leads the people into the wilderness. And now in the wilderness, God says, now that we've established some relationship, I want to have a place to, to, to have worship. We need a building. We need a church. We need a tabernacle. And in order to do that, there are things that need to happen to make this happen. And so our story now picks up with you and me and humanity. In Exodus chapter 35, at the beginning of that chapter, in Exodus chapter 35, Moses is God's man. Here's what you need to understand about Moses. We read about this incredible thing. A sea of tents as far as the eye can see, spreading across, spreading across the, the pebbled and sandy surface and terrain of the wilderness. But there's one tent outside of this gathering of tents, and it it's the tent where Moses meets with God. And every time, every time Moses would go to that tent, there would be a cloud that would be the, the, the glory of God that would descend upon that tent. And Moses would go into the tent to hear from God how to lead the people. And it says that when Moses went to the tent, all the people stood at the entrance of their tents and watched Moses until he got inside the tent. And then they went about their business. Well, in one of those occasions when Moses is in the tent... God and Moses have a conversation. And in Exodus chapter 35, beginning in verse number 4, Moses has a word, and he brings it back to the people. In verse number 4, Moses said to the whole community of Israel, the millions that stood before him that day, out on the warm sands, the warm sands of the wilderness, shaded by a cloud that God supernaturally covered the Israelites with, so as not to be scorched in the heat of the wilderness. They all stood in this amazing, massive gathering. I can imagine Moses standing atop a jagged rock that he could see over the masses of people. He's been in the tent. And he says to all the people, this is what the Lord has commanded. This is not an idea that I had. This is not something that a committee of people came up. This is birthed out of the heart of God, and I'm going to tell you what God said. The Lord commanded it, Yahweh, God himself. This is what he wants us to do. Verse number five, take a sacred offering for the Lord. Not for me, not for the elders, not for Pharaoh because we feel bad that he lost his army. I mean, this is, we're going to take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. And now he starts to enumerate. Those with generous hearts, not those who are greedy, not those who are stingy, not those who are going to be grumpy, not those who are crabby and don't want to do anything for God. Let those with genuine hearts bring the following things before the Lord, gold and silver and bronze. And the list goes on in verse 6. Blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat hair for cloth, and tanned ram skins, and fine goat skins, leather, and acacia wood. Going on to verse number 8. Olive oil for the lamps, and spices for anointing oil, and fragrant incense, onyx stones, and other gemstones to be set in the ephod, or the breastplate that goes over the priest's chest piece. God said, look, I've got a plan. And in order to make the plan happen, we need some specific things to put it all together. God is a God of detail. God is a God of plans. God knows what needs to happen, and he knows how to make it happen. And he knows where the resources can be found. And he says, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to work together, and we're going to make this happen. We're going to bring all these resources together, and you wait and see what my plan is and how it comes to play. And verse number 10, I love verse number 10. Come, all of you who are gifted craftsmen, construct everything that the Lord has commanded. God said, not only do we need resources of resources, we need resources of people and skill and ability. And there is people just like that in this gathering today. Or if you're watching online or watching at home, you're people that God has gifted in your hands. It's amazing what the hands of a human being can do. It's amazing. 
So we've got all kinds of resources we're going to bring together to make this happen. Now skipping down to verse number 20. So the whole community of Israel left Moses and they returned to their tents. I love this. Moses, Moses gave a command. He says, this is the plan. This is the goal. This is the vision. This is the direction. This is what's going to happen. And the people didn't stand and argue. Well, but uh, you know, have you guys decided what color the walls are going to be? I don't know if this is a good plan because we don't know how long we're going to be here. No argument. They just went back to their tents. And I think on the way back to the tents, they're thinking in their minds. I think I got some, some scarlet thread at home. I got some bronze, and you know, Bert looks at Ethel. You got that old brooch Grandma gave you. You never wear it anymore anyway. You know, started having a conversation about all the things they had at home. So they go back to their tents, and in verse number 21, all whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and they brought the sacred offering to the Lord. I think they had a lot of occasion and a great reason to have hearts stirred by the Spirit of God. I mean, (laughs) can you imagine the conversation? We've we've got a plan. We've got a goal. We've got a direction. We've got a vision. We're going to build something for God. This is going to be exciting. All of a sudden, all of these millions of people had one goal, one purpose, one direction, one strategy, and it was God birthed, and we're moving in that direction, and they went home, and they, they found their things, and their hearts were moved. There was an excitement about it. We can't wait to get the project started. Let's go, because they started thinking about where they were for 430 years. We were slaves. We had nothing. We didn't know what we were going to eat. We didn't like the food that we had. We didn't have any kind, of a, any kind of a free will. We were slaves for 400 years. We had nothing. And now look at all that we have. Not only do we have all of the provisions God has given us, we got to walk through the Red Sea. Don't know how God did that, but the water just kind of stacked up and we walked through. You could see fish swimming around. We got over on dry ground. Then the most powerful army in the whole world drowned in the Red Sea. Then we get on the other side. God miraculously provides food from heaven. We don't know about this whole thing. God's given us clothes to wear, shoes that don't wear out. He's covered us in the sunlight. I think we have a lot to give thanks to God for. And they got got excited. And so they just had all of this gratitude for the Lord. And, And then it says in verse 22 that both men and women, and I I I love this. I'm gonna pause right here for a moment. Both men and women. Probably no other single document given to mankind, no other single document then the Bible itself brings more dignity and value to women than the Word of God does. Because this is not a man thing. This isn't the the kind of the good old boys club. This isn't the yacht club or the golf club or the hunting club. This is families. This is couples. This is men and women coming together. And they all came whose hearts were willing and they brought to the Lord their offerings of gold brooches, earrings and rings from their fingers and necklaces. And they presented gold objects of every kind in a special offering to the Lord. You know what I love? about this? Here's the backstory to what we just read here. When, when Israel left Egypt, Moses told the Israelites, he said, before you leave, you go ask your neighbors for some stuff. And so the Israelites went to the people that had enslaved them for 400 years. They just knocked on the door. They opened the door and didn't even have to say a thing, and they just shoved stuff in their hands. They plundered Egypt when they left. They left with their gold jewelry, their bracelets, their rings, their money, their fine linens. They walked out of Egypt. They plundered the nation of Egypt because God moved the hearts of the Egyptians. Just get them out of here. Just get them out of here and give them stuff to go. And so the Egyptian resources, the enemy's resources, the worldly resources were going to build the temple of God. It was an amazing thing. And I think of what's happening in Williston, North Dakota right now. Guess where the money is going to come from to build God's temple? All the people driving their cars, burning up gasoline. Hallelujah for high gas prices. Okay. It's an amazing thing. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the word of God says, and he owns the gas in a thousand tanks. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, they plundered Egypt, and we just remember it's not our stuff that does anything for God. It's God's stuff that does God's stuff. Verse number 23 says that all those who owned the following items willingly brought them. And then again in verse 25, all the women, all the women, men praise God for the women. I heard one man Praise God for the women. Men, praise God for the women. Amen? 
And you go, all the women who were skilled in sewing and spinning prepared blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen cloth. What we understand from this is that some people, some people, some people have resources of wealth and some people are just a wealth of resources. Some people have been just gifted money and they're, they have all kinds of financial resources. Some people have some resources, but they've got skill and ability and all of it combined together. You and me are the body of Christ. We are the tapestry that works together for one goal, one cause, one mind, one purpose to reach the people outside of the walls of this church and all woven together. Together we bring our uniquenesses, our distinguishing marks, all combined together. It's an incredible thing. And Jesus is the head of the body, and we move ahead with his purposes. And that's exactly what we see happening in here. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Some, some people have money in hand, and some people have skills at hand. And so, verse number 29 says that the, the, the people, the people of Israel... Again, every man and woman who was eager to help in the work of the Lord had given them through Moses, brought their gifts, and they gave freely to the Lord. <laughs> I can imagine this. I can imagine this. Okay, all right, what do we have? What do we have for the project? I mean, Moses outlined it. He said we need gold and bronze and silver. We need some uh, goat skins. We need some ram skins. We need some acacia wood. What do we have around here? What do we have around here? And they started to gather stuff up. Moses had to organize people to organize what was being brought. And so over here, we've got a pile of acacia wood. We're stacking up some skins over here. Here's a pile of gold on the ground. We've got some silver and some bronze. And they got people overseeing all of this because we've got to bring organization to all of it. And so the people started to get excited. They're eager to get to work. Let's get this going. Let's, let's, let's just do this. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And, and men and women. And, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then God empowered two guys, two special guys. At the end of chapter 35 and beginning of 36, their names were Bezalel and Aholiab. And they became the Bezalel and Aholiab Construction Company. And God specially empowered them by his Holy Spirit to work with gold and with the precious metals that would come. And God has in mind to build this tabernacle, this tent. It was called the Tent of Meeting, and it had uh, tent-like walls around it. You maybe have seen pictures, maybe you've read through your Bible to read about this, and in the midst of this, there was, there was a tent and inside of the tent, there was this box made of acacia wood covered in gold and had two cherubim on the top, poles underneath to carry this. I know you've seen it because, because you can watch Raiders of the Lost Ark almost any day of the week on some channel on your TV set. So I know that you've seen what this box looked like. That box would bear the presence of God. He would sit on the mercy seat right on the, the cover of that thing. And so within, within that tent was this gold box, the Ark of the Covenant. And God was telling the nations, this is where the presence of God is. In the New Testament, God took his spirit and put it in you and said, look where Jesus is today. It's in my believers and my followers. But nonetheless, the intent was none so different as to say that God cares about his people. <laughs> so in Exodus chapter 36, verse number two, Moses gets busy here. Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab and all the others who were specially gifted by the Lord. And I love this. They were eager. They were eager. They were eager to do the work. I know that that's exactly where we are. We've been talking about building. Maybe you're new to Life Church, but we, we've been planning. We've been strategizing. We've been meeting together as committees. We've got, we've got building committee meetings. Uh, we've got team leader meetings. We've got blueprints. We've got plans. We've been talking to architects for the last two plus years. We've been talking about this. We've just been sitting on the runway, revving the engine, getting ready to go, getting ready to go. And today is the day that we're going to finally take off and get this baby moving. I'm telling you, for the last two years, we're eager to do the work and let's get it going. Let's get this moving. Let's get this plane. Let's get this baby up in the air. And so that's exactly what's going on here in the story. They're ready to go. In verse number three, Moses gave the materials donated by the people of Israel as sacred offerings for the completion of the sanctuary. And then, and then an, another sentence begins in this verse with a three-letter conjunctive word, but. And whenever you read that little three-letter word, sometimes good things follow and sometimes bad things follow. But in this instance, it's, it's, it's a good thing. But it says, but the people, but the people continued to bring additional gifts. 
each morning. I mean, they walked back in their tent. They already brought something for the offering. They already brought something for the ark. And then they went back and said, I don't need this. I can live without this. You know why? Because all of a sudden people overcame fear of the unknown, fear of the impossible, fear of sacrifice, fear of disappointment. Their faith started to rise within them. They said, God is the one who brought us through the Red Sea. God is the one that provided for us food to eat. God is the one who redeemed us. God is the one who lifted us up out of slavery. And I think in a moment those people's hearts were stirred and they realized that the compassion of God was bigger than the comforts of man, that the plans of God were bigger than the plans of man. I think they got excited about what we're doing. We're moving together in a direction. There's a purpose in this. And let it be said, let it be known this morning. We're, we're, we're planning to expand a church here at Life Church to tell our community that God cares about his people. <laughs> well, verse number four says, finally the craftsmen who were working on the sanctuary left their work. What? There was a work stoppage. It's not like we went on strike. They just stopped their work. They had a problem. And so the union gets together and they got a union foreman and a boss. And they said, we got to go back. We got to talk to Moses. We have a problem here. And it was a great problem because verse, verse number five says, they went to Moses and reported the people have given more. More than enough <laughs> materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. Like, we, we, we don't know what to do with everything they're bringing. What a great problem to have, isn't it? And then the very next verse is every pastor's dream. I hope that I can stand up before you someday and tell you what's said in verse number six. So Moses gave the command and the message was sent throughout the whole camp. Men and women, don't bring any more money. <laughs> Don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. We have enough. What a great problem. God, stop bringing. They were restrained. Some Bible said they were restrained from giving. It's like they were walking up to the pile of gold, walking up to the pile of ramskins, walking up to the pile of vocation. No, 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 no. Take it home. But I don't want to take it home. Take it home. We've got too much. Like, take it home. Because we got more than enough. And you know why they had more than enough? Because, because God stirred the hearts of the people, and so the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. And, and then in verse number 7, it's punctuated. Verse number 7, their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm just telling you this morning, if you're watching uh, somewhere else or you're here today, make my dreams come true, right? All right. Church, I just love to get up next Sunday morning and say, look, we kind of had a budget in mind for this whole project. You guys just gave too much, and we've just got more than we need, so thank you. Robin and I are going to go on a cruise. Hallelujah. I mean, that's <laughs> where we're at. So make my dream come true. Make it complete, complete. So let me ask you this, church. Why, 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 why are we going to build a church? I'll tell you why I want to build the church. It's not so that our children have a play area, though I think our children, I want a play area for our children. It's not so that we have a bigger sanctuary, though we need a bigger sanctuary. It's not something for our youth and our students, though our students need something. Ultimately, the reason that we need to expand our facility is to let our community and surrounding region know that God cares about people. That God cares about people that God really does care about people. He cares about his creation. He cares about what he has made. So much so. And the reason that you're in church this morning, the reason that you're in a church, maybe this is your first church experience, maybe you've had other church experiences, but somewhere along the line, somebody within their heart, they had a, they had a heart for you. They became the expression of God to you to say God cares about you and your life was a, a, a crumbled mess. It was, it, was, it was a wreck and there was something going on in your life and somebody reached out to you with love and said God cares about you and you responded to that and here you are on this Sunday morning and that's exactly what we, we, we want to do in our communities. We want to let people know that God cares about people because a long, 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 long time ago God invented people and his heart for people has not changed since the day he made it. And so, so you found a church, you stumbled across a church, you came to this church, and kind of the, the, the whole thing about life church is, is that, that, that people would, would come here and they would, they would discover people like you. 
And when they do, they, they, they find friends. They find some friends here. And you know what they find? They find real people at this church. They find people who are not fakey. They're not hypocritical. They're not lying people. They're just honest people that have been on the same journey. They've gone through the same struggles. They've been through the divorce. They've been through the breakups. They've been through the ups and the downs. They've been through the addictions. They've been through the problems. They've been victimized, and they've had all kinds of problems. But they found Jesus, and then they, they relay. They go, really? Me? That's ex-. And then they find friends. And then in the process of understanding that your story is real and that God is real, then they, then they find God. And then, and then, and suddenly when they find God, they find hope, they find redemption, they find dignity, they find value, they find purity, they find cleansing, they find purpose. They're repurposed and all new and they find God. And as a result of finding God, they find life and they have life and purpose and focus and they move ahead. Oh, it's exciting. And the amazing thing is, the amazing thing is God is letting us be a part of that. A long, long time ago, before God invented people, <laughs> he made the earth. And he put all the resources of earth here before he made people because God cares about people. He had to give them something so they could be supplied for. And, and in the process of making this, this ball that we <laughs> stand on today, God, I think, by design, in no accident, put some oil in the ground. <laughs> and then he gave people the ability to know how to find the oil and extract it and bring it out. And then when people discovered how to do that, God started bringing Ghana and Nigeria and Liberia and all kinds of foreign countries like, like California and Texas and New York and Florida. It's, it's by design that God put the resources here and gave man the, the intellect to extract it from the ground and bring the nations to Williston that they can find friends and find life and find God, be it in our church or some other church. That's by God's design. He's so strategic. It's exciting to just be a part of this whole whole process. <laughs> well, here we are in Williston, North Dakota. Now, let me, let me finish this part of the journey before we, before we get into the next step of what we're going to do this morning. Also, a long, long time ago, people waited on God and they found God through prayer, and praying, just seeking the face of God, and a movement began. And that movement hit Williston, North Dakota. In fact, the historian for the Assemblies of God says that um, this is the oldest gathering Assembly of God established church in the United States today. And so a part of that whole thing a long, long time ago, a gathering of people began in Williston. And it started down here on Broadway in Williston. A little church that's now a house or an apartment building just off of 2nd Avenue. You can drive by this little church where God met with people so many years ago to say, I love you and I care about people. And, and uh, other people discovered that God loves them so very, very much. And well, as a result, the church began to grow. And the facility no longer worked for them. And so... In about 1962, they moved out of this building and into this building. You can find this one right behind the swimming pool or behind Taco John's, kind of squeezed in there. And for about 21 years, a little congregation met in this church. I was water baptized in this church back in 1987. We borrowed the church on a Sunday night because they had a built-in baptismal tank in their church, and this one does not. And, and so I remember that night so very, very well. And then about uh, another 20 years later, 1983, they moved out of this church building and they moved into this church building. Maybe you recognize this one. And, and this was built, I think they moved into here in 1983. I... Uh, came to this church for the first time in 1986. And in 1983, this was, this was supposed to be phase one. <laughs> this was phase one. The, the box that you're in this morning, this was to be a gymnasium and there was to be a Christian school. There, there was this intent in the heart to educate our students in this biblical foundation. And at the other end of this facility, there was going to be a sanctuary that would be built for the worship of God and the impact of our community. Well, the oil boom went. 
Boom, <laughs> went bust, and money left town. Uh, coincidentally, I found, I found the placard that was needed to raise money to build this facility. $750,000 they had to come up with, and that was a stretch 30 years ago. How much money did you have 30 years ago? <laughs> and uh, so here Life Church has been for 31 years in this building, and we recognize the need for greater growth for greater impact to reach the city of Williston. And it's not about brick and mortar. It's about flesh and blood. And in fact, in all of these buildings that I'm showing you, if you could strip down these buildings to the barest of foundations, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere on the bricks, somewhere on the mortar, somewhere on the drywall, the paint, or even the foundation beneath the carpet, you would find remnants of blood, sweat, and tears of people who had a vision and a passion to impact this community. And so now after so much planning, we have moved ahead and have looked at a facility that might look something like this. And up in the very top center, you can see just the little building that we're in now and what we're hoping to add on with a children's area and a youth facility and a larger sanctuary. And it might not look exactly like this when it's all done, but this is a concept that when you'd pull in the parking lot, you'd see something that looked a little bit like this so that Life Church can have an impact on the city of Williston, North Dakota. This is the direction we want to go. And so now, this is your opportunity. This is your time. As we prepare a sacred offering a sacred offering, a sacred offering to do the work of God. I believe that this is birthed in the heart of God. We have had so many meetings and so much prayer time talking about this and just how the whole thing has come through. We just really believe that this is not an idea or a plan from man. I don't think God really cares much about brick and mortar, but one thing I do know that God cares about, God cares about people. That's what he cares about. So I'm going to ask our ushers just now, they're going to serve you with an envelope and a pledge card, and I'll give you some instructions about each of these as you receive them. We'll just do them one per individual or one per family, however you want to receive these today. And uh, you can take a look-see over all of them when you receive them today. Now, while they're distributing those, let me, let me share with you what's in these buckets up here. Is maybe you've been a little bit curious what's inside. Rocks. I'm a big spender. And I bought all of you a rock. And you can take a rock home. And there's a purpose behind these rocks. There's a purpose behind these rocks. This is going to be your prayer rock until we break ground. As you hold this rock in your hand, I want you to feel it with your fingers. The ridges, and the valleys, the pockmarks, some dirt maybe even on the outside. In all the uniquenesses of this rock, I want you to be thinking about the uniquenesses of families and people that will walk through the doors of Life Church in the generations to come. And you're going to pray for people, families, individuals that maybe, maybe you will never meet until you get to the other side and get in heaven. And I want you to pray for a family, I want you to pray for an individual while holding on to this rock with all of its uniquenesses. There's all different sorts of rocks in these pails. They're all different from one another, just like people. And I want you to pray for the rock. And then, and then, and then next spring, listen to me, next spring, when we break ground, I don't know anything about doing concrete work or cement work. I might make the contractor mad, but I want us all to get together with our prayer rocks. And we're going to throw our rocks out into the foundation of our church. That prayer for people is going to be the foundation before we even build upon that concrete. That out in the midst of that concrete, it's going to bear your prayer rock with your DNA stuck to the surface of this rock. It's going to forever be embedded into the concrete and the foundation of God's church.